Good day, everyone. Welcome to today's presentation, Fire Alarm System Estimating, What to Expect from Your Provider, provider sponsored by Johnson Controls. My name is Colleen Beatty, and I'm the senior editor here at Electrical Contractor Magazine. On behalf of the magazine, I want to thank all of you for attending today's presentation. Before we get started, I just need to quickly go over some housekeeping items. First, please note that today's presentation is being recorded and we'll be providing you with a link to the recording after the webinar is over. So if you miss anything or you have to leave a little bit early, that's okay. You can come back anytime and watch the recording when it works for you. And of course, we encourage your participation in today's webinar, so please send us your questions. You can submit them at any time in, during the presentation using the Q&A module. It should be on the bottom right of your screen. You can also use the Q&A module to send us any uh, technical issues you might be having, such as uh, issues with your audio um, or otherwise. There's also a quick survey that should pop up on your screen at the end of the webinar, and we hope you'll fill that out. Uh, or if you'd like to fill it out sooner, just click the icon with the clipboard at the bottom of your screen, um, and it will pop right up. So with all that out of the way, I'd like to give a warm welcome to today's speakers from Johnson Controls Fire Protection. First, we have Todd Jackson, who is the Vice President of Sales at Johnson Controls Fire Protection, and Brian Essig, who is the Area Sales Manager. Welcome, Todd and Brian. Hey, thank you for having us. All right, we ready to roll, Colleen? Yes, we are. All right, so, so thanks everyone who's taken time out of your busy day. If, if you're on this call, um, you're most likely an electrical contractor who would like to learn a little bit about um, uh, what a good estimate looks like and what you should expect from a fire alarm provider. And the things that Brian and I will cover with you today are really um, system and product agnostic on what you should look for. And then, um, you know, towards the end of the discussion, which we're targeting about 45 minutes to open it up with Q&A, um, we just want to show you some of the technology differentiators that, that we bring to the market that, that'll help achieve some of the things that will help you win in the new construction space, which we all know is highly competitive. So myself, I've been in this industry for 27, uh, excuse me, 25 years uh, this month, and, uh, and I've been in a number of different roles from uh, in the field organization, estimating fire alarm projects to contractors, national accounts, and so on. Uh, but in the electronic fire alarm space. So, so Bri introducing Brian, who's based in in, um, in Huntsville, Alabama, and has been in our industry. Brian, how long have you been with us in our industry? Yeah, so Todd, first of all, um, it's good to be with everybody today, but just over 25 years now. Yeah, so you got, you got 50 years of scars, mistakes, <laughs> learnings that, uh, that we're going to share <clears throat> with you today. So let's take a look at the agenda. So... We're going to introduce this concept of the fire alarm system cost equation. It's not a heavy math discussion, but it's to get you thinking about how do you add up all the components that you need to responsibly estimate a project. Some of it belongs to the co electrical contractor. Some of it belongs to your fire alarm provider. We're going to go over the fundamentals of the fire alarm estimate. And then really the value added part of this discussion is beyond that estimate, what should you be looking for from your fire alarm provider to make sure that you're getting a comprehensive estimate that helps you be efficient on the job, use lower skilled labor as much as you can to do the installation, do the installation faster, and use less materials. If you can do all that, you're going to be more competitive than other contractors who are not following this process. Then we'll give a summary of this and open it up to Q&A. So, with that, here it is, the fire alarm system cost equation. It's really very simple. There's labor and material for both, both providers. So I'm gonna tackle the electrical contractor side, and obviously this is not all encompassing, but these are some of the, the big items that show up in your estimates. So on your labor side, you've got a, if you're a small contractor, somebody in, in your office or yourself, you're doing the purchasing, but somebody's gotta do that work. And then when you get out on the job, you're pulling wire, you're installing, bending and cutting conduit, you're uh, installing devices in some cases uh, towards the end of the job, you're troubleshooting, which is probably your least favorite thing to do. I know it's our least favorite thing to do. You're removing trash, you might be storing materials, 
you gotta you gotta pay people for parking all of these things add into your labor stack and of course there's other things that i haven't shared that you're probably already thinking of and then on the material side which we all know has been quite an experience whether it's fire alarm material or steel or wire over the past 24 months the cost of materials has been going through the roof so you get your conduit your back boxes your miscellaneous things sometimes you need a trailer if the job's really large uh, or a storage module and then you got your phones and then whatever you need to satisfy general conditions if that's what's in your specification so you know, i'm going to pitch it over to brian brian let's kind of highlight what's in the what comes from the fire alarm provider from a labor and material standpoint yeah so let's talk about that so the fire alarm estimate also uh todd has two cost categories and so having a good handle on all the elements that make up these costs can really help you de-risk your project from overruns and then ultimately uh, keep you on schedule. So if you look at this page under the, the fire alarm labor section, this is where you can really make sure there's close alignment with your fire alarm partners on how you're gonna go compete for work in the market. So here is a good idea um, to have them explain to you how they plan to deliver all the different facets of the overall labor solution. That includes technical project management labor, uh, as well as engineering and design labor, so that when all those pieces come together, it fits your schedule. And so other things that you that you want to look for are, um, is the project phased? Will multiple fire marshal inspections be required? Uh, is, the, is the project management scope sufficient for making sure that everyone stays on track and then two, um, you want to make sure there's clarity around who's carrying the installation costs for all for all the uh, wiring, the field peripheral devices, as well as the head end equipment. And so, if you take a look at this slide over on the on the right there, you can see uh, the typical material cost items that uh, the fire alarm provider usually includes in their in their bid to you: uh, head end equipment, peripheral devices, specialized enunciators for. Uh, things like smoke control systems come into play, exhaust systems. And so, you know, you can see pretty clearly there, those are those are all the major elements that make up the typical estimate. So once you've pulled all of this information together, you're really kind of ready to go to the next step and start zeroing in on more of the details. So, Todd, if we go to the next screen here, I think you're going to introduce this concept of uh, cost and speed to us. Yeah, thanks, Brian. So, so the folks that are really good at installing any any system, whether it's low voltage or high voltage, you try to optimize your labor uh, and you try to optimize the skill that it takes to install the equipment. So the winning recipe here is you take this equation and you look for providers that can speed up your installation so you're on the job for less of time, the less time you're on the job, the less billable hours you have from the crew that's out there working for you. And then if you can drive down the cost, the cost of your labor in some cases where perhaps we're gonna share with you what to look for, you could use a $22 an hour somebody instead of a $42 an hour somebody. And that makes a big difference when you go into these estimates because you wanna win. You're competing with a lot of people for the same job in whatever market you're in. And then if you can pick a choose a provider that lowers the cost of material to install the fire alarm technology, that's gonna help you win as well, as well and help you be aggressive on your costs. And as we like to say in our world, cost is cost. And you'll get multiple bids from multiple providers. And the trick is to figure out who's gonna help you be faster and who's gonna lower your material cost based on the solution and everything that comes with it that they're offering you. So Brian, let's hit the high points on what are the fundamentals of a fire alarm estimate? Yeah, so let's talk about the basics of uh, uh, the estimate. So this is a great place to start from because um, what you guys are gonna be able to do is cover 80 to 90% of your project uh, needs with, with the list of items that you see here on the screen. So. The first one is pretty obvious, plans and specs, and are they covered? Uh, are there any exceptions that we need to take to those documents to make sure risk items have been addressed? Do you see any code or design uh, deficiencies that we need to be aware of? And then two, is there a really clear scope of work that defines roles and responsibilities, and is that communicated on the bid proposal? 
And then th there's some often overlooked items too to keep in mind. Sometimes spare parts get overlooked, but they're really important. Um, circuit loading, uh, safety factor requirements uh, for, for, the, for the system, for the power circuits, as well as your addressable uh, communication circuits. And then also identifying other building system connections like tampers and flow switches. There's certainly more than that, but those are just some that uh, come to mind right off the top of my head. And so let's, um, um, Todd, go to our poll question and, and go to the next slide here. Uh, and we wanna hear from you guys. Um, so when that comes up, I'll let Colleen um, set up the uh, poll question for us. Yeah, go ahead and click on your screen right in the slide area. You can select multiple options and we'll just give everyone a minute or so to answer. And none of these are pleasant when they happen. Just to reiterate, they're not pleasant for you as a contractor. They're not pleasant for any fire alarm provider because they, they stretch everybody out on the job and, and they drive up cost. So you can vote for more than one thing on the page, by the way. You might need to scroll down in order to hit the submit button. Okay. We good, Colleen? All right, yeah, let's go ahead. All, All right, let's see what we got. All right, late product delivery. If anybody on this phone has not had an experience with that, Brian, <laughs> of late, um, <laughs> then uh, you're probably not working on fire alarm jobs or on the right jobs, right? So Brian, right. what jumps out at you here? Yeah, so I think I'm, a, I'm, I'm not really surprised. I think, you know, other trades getting ahead of the fire alarm installation, it looks like that's the, the one that's, uh, that, that's out front. And that could be a pretty big problem, right? I mean, if you've um, got trades that are blocking your way or you aren't closely coordinated with, especially trades who, who the fire alarm system has to communicate with or connect to, then that can be a big problem. So, yeah, it's interesting. Yeah, and then I, the other one that jumps out at me here is the troubleshooting taking too long. Uh, you know what? You know that when you have something that you can't nail down, whether it's a, a ground fault or uh, you know devices that are duplicated in address, and you're searching for smoke detectors down a long hallway that have the same address and they're difficult to identify, that is definitely you know many many of you and, and and at times your fire alarm provider will carry some degree of risk in the job but you could burn through those dollars pretty quickly troubleshooting um troubleshooting a system that's not operating properly and then i thought this other one was interesting brian this this weak programming skills from the fire alarm provider there's nothing worse than than having a technician come out and get ready to light up a system and then they're on the phone with their buddy who knows more about the system than they do and you know, you as a contractor standing there expecting to do some preliminary testing, and instead you're watching the back of somebody who's probably not properly trained on your job. So Brian, anything else to, to comment on here? Yeah, no, not really. I mean, that really causes cost overruns and you know, it can slow down the project and cause you to miss deadlines. So yeah, that's a, that's a good one too, Todd. But yeah, that's, I'm, I'm not surprised by the responses here. Yeah, great. Okay, so let's move on to, uh, to uh, some of the common reasons that we saw here, right? So you, you, most of you voted for a lot of these at least once or twice. So, so let's start to get into the, the value added part of this discussion. So what should you look for beyond the fire alarm estimate, beyond the bill of materials, beyond the price, beyond the plans and specs, right? And um, so we've kind of broken it up into five basic things to look for. And it starts with shop drawing details, and in that we would include a scope of work, and then the QC, the quality control methods during the installation. We'll we'll we'll, sh we'll tell you what we what we believe is important around that, and what you should look for. Technology advantages to the platforms that are out there. You've got your Notifier, your EST, your Simplex. You've got all these different brands out there, and and they all have nuances in how they go in, and some of those nuances help you speed up. Um, and drop your costs and some of them slow you down or could increase your costs. And, and it's important to understand the differences. And then shop programming. And what we mean by that is ideally your system is showing up at the job site programmed rather than programming at the job site. And we'll show you the advantages of that approach and what to look for. And then local code knowledge. This, this really comes down to the skill and the understanding uh, of the code 
the codes of where the system is being installed and who's going to enforce them. So let's grab this first topic of shop drawing details and then the scope of work. So as Brian mentioned, um, you get the fundamentals of, of the estimate, but if you are not getting a good scope of work, which has a solid demarcation of where your responsibility as the contractor starts and ends, and where your fire alarm provider starts and ends, you're both open for interpretation. And as the job winds down to the end, fingers start to get pointed. So you can avoid that headache by addressing it on the front end when you're collecting your estimates and leveling your, your bids, right? Point to point diagrams for devices. This is something I had a contractor teach me in Boston, which is where I near where I live. And what he taught me is if you can get me the detail from the building, the penetration point, the rack the gear is going in, the card in the pin, and the wire type, I can use a lower skilled person to do that installation because I can give them these drawings. And if they follow the drawings the way that you've given them to me, I can rely on my, uh, my individual out there to follow those instructions. Easy to read installation instructions and by extension, what can you get to online? So if, if one, of your, um, one of your installation folks is standing in front of a device and they're not quite sure which way the wires go or they're looking at the diagram and they want to validate something, boy, getting a couple clicks away on their, on their smartphone device to get information really produces um, the outcomes here in the middle. So, Brian, you know, why don't you summarize what our contractors should be looking for around shop drawing and scope of work? Yeah, sure. So I think, first of all, you know, the, the scope of work that shows inclusions and exclusions is a great place for your fire alarm partner um, to, to really help protect you from risk uh, on the project. But it's also a great place to make recommendations on items that will help drive a better uh, installation experience um, and, and overall outcome for the project. And so um, I encourage you to ask for that. And then, Todd, you talked about this earlier. The quality of the shop drawings can really make or break a project and whether or not it goes smoothly or ends up with, with issues on it. And so a good best practice here is to have, have your fire alarm provider um, share example of, of drawing packages that they've done from past projects so that you know what you're buying and that you're getting a good um, quality product. And then um, also installation standards are our best practice right now of the top fire alarm providers in the industry. And so um, most of the most of us have them, and so I would encourage you to ask your partner what, what their established standards are and, and what they should be able to, and they should be able to provide that. Um, it's not only a good thing to talk about before the bid and during the bid, but it's also good to talk about during the scope leveling meeting once the um, the project is ready to get kicked off and you're making that decision and, and, and ensuring those practices are in place, and then. Lastly, you know, it is really preferable uh, would highly recommend that. Uh, whoever you're partnering with, that, that they self-perform and they have internal resources that can do their engineering and shop drawings. What this is going to do for you is it really lowers the risk of dealing with conflicts between an engineering subcontractor, if that's what they do, um, and, and the provider when they occur during the installation. Just really helps the installation go, go smoother. And so, Todd, I think we're going to go to the next slide here. Uh, next up is quality control, right? Yeah, yeah. So, so QC methods for installation. So, uh, there are some fire alarm providers that that uh, can really get you ahead of the curve on this. So, best practices that we see are installers that are testing branch circuits once they're completed, and and ideally you're doing this before the fire alarm panel shows up. Because oftentimes you got to wait for power uh, to be run to that fire alarm panel to eat, to make it useful. You don't really want to use that high dollar piece of equipment as a piece of test equipment out of the chute when you get your infrastructure and your wiring plant in place. So, you know, the best providers offer ways to test these branch circuits and validate them. And when I say test, I mean beyond just your simple multimeter, do I have a short to ground uh, or do I have the right resistance loop uh, down the wire through the end of line resistor and back. So um, other ways to really protect yourself is by documenting your test results to the GC. You spend a lot of time and money and materials getting a wiring plant in place for a fire alarm system, and then you leave 
for two weeks while the HVAC team gets in there and they start hanging their duct work or you know, you know other trades are in there and you might have a wire nicked. And now uh, you have a change order situation. My wiring plant was, was, was clean and green as we like to call it two weeks ago and, and now it's compromised. So doing this kind of um, QC, um, these QC motions protects your completed work from re rework and really sets yourself up for defending yourself in a change order situation, but also will reduce your troubleshooting time because ideally you're testing your circuits as you build out the system and you're not waiting for when that fire alarm panel shows up and then ultimately you get it powered up and you have 27 ground faults on the system that you now have to run down all at once. So Brian, why don't you share with folks what, what they should be looking for from their provider in this space? Yeah, I think this is pretty straightforward. And Todd, you, you said it. a lot of manufacturers nowadays, fire alarm manufacturers have customized tools that help, help test uh, circuits before we bring the uh, fire alarm panel out to the, to the job site and start connecting the field devices to it. So what you're able to really do with these tools is make sure there's good circuit integrity uh, before you start hooking everything up. And what I would tell you to keep in mind, besides asking for the tool, make sure that there's training available for you and your team that's doing the installation so that when they're using the, the tool, they're really able to maximize the benefit from it, use it properly. And like Todd said, some of these tools uh, allow you to generate a report that you can protect yourself with in terms of giving it to a general contractor so that they can see everything is, is like Todd said, clean and green, and you can move on to the next thing. So, Todd, let's go to the next slide. Great, thanks, Brian. So, another thing you should be looking for is technology advantages. And so, what do we mean by that? Again, there's a multitude of great products out there, um, and they all have different different ways of operating with each of the components, the field devices, your smoke detectors, your pull stations, your notification appliances, and they all have a unique way that they need to be wired. The better platforms that you'll find, and many of you on this call have installed all the brands that we've talked about on this call, you should be looking for, um, or understanding, I should say, from your estimates, which of the estimates and the technologies that you are, that are bidding to you require home runs versus able to split circuits down the middle, and then you can tap off of circuits in the middle of a hallway or in the middle of a riser, which technology platforms allow you to use distributed power supplies and sub panels, again, eliminating those home runs. And again, you're trading off that. Maybe the material price or cost is a little higher with one provider, but I'm gonna use less labor to put it in. That's why we, we talk about this whole equation, right? And then how are the devices addressed? This is really important because there are providers out there that address devices at the, within the device itself. There's technology within the device or there's technology within the fixture and you could put any device in that fixture and it'll register with the proper address. So these are things that, that you know, you should be, um, you should understand what you're getting across the platforms and your outcomes that you get if you choose the right one, you'll use less wire you'll use less labor to run that wire. And depending on the addressability technology, you could carry a box of the same devices out to the field and it doesn't matter which one you pull out of the box to snap into the fixture, or you're gonna have to spend time labeling each device because the address is in that device and you've gotta put that device in the right place or, you're gonna, or it's gonna report incorrectly back to the panel. So Brian, what should these uh, wonderful people we're talking to today look for from their provider? Yeah, so I, yeah absolutely. So um, what I'd really focus on here is, and you touched on this, Todd, but is really having a good understanding um, of how the technology works, or at least enough so that you can create ways to, to maximize your labor efficiencies um, on things like you're running less uh, home runs for, for your wiring, um, installing the risers efficiently enough to minimize branch circuits. And so, you know, having a meeting up front on the, on the project that you're working on or the opportunity that you're working on with your fire alarm provider can really help you 
uh, hone in on ways to 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 take advantage of this. And and ultimately, what it'll do is it'll help you uh, improve your hit weight rate on uh, projects that you win in the market. So let's go to the next slide. All right, well put, well put. So then we got programming the system, and you know we identify as we call it shop programming. You could call it factory programming. So a lot of fire alarm providers, again, regardless of the platform that they're bringing to you, um, they're sending a programmed panel to the site with all of the fire alarm sequences in that panel. And um, they're validating the fire alarm functionality and programming before they send it out to the job site. Again, I've had a lot of contractors that I've worked with over my career. The best ones that I've worked with do this because they're, they're not, they, they, they make sure it's happening so they know they're carrying an asset out to the field that needs minimal touch, should be minimal touch as design. And if a lot of touch is required, that could be a change order opportunity for both the fire alarm provider and then the contractor who's carrying that forward. So the outcomes that this would produce is you get consistent system programming and startup you get device counts and labels that if they change, so let's let's just take a scenario. You got a three-story uh, building, you know, call it a medical office building, and you ship the, the panel shows up, you put the panel on the wall, you terminate the circuits, and all of a sudden there's four there's four more devices that need to be programmed. Well, something changed from the time that system was programmed to what got installed. Now there's an opportunity for everybody to get a change order because the system got bigger for whatever reason. Maybe there were more air handlers and you had to add you had to add four more duct detectors. And then those detectors need to be programmed into the panel. So um, and then other things like sequences that change due to the installation. So it could be smoke control sequences that changed based on field conditions. It could be um, interactions with um, air handlers shut down. Uh, and then we're seeing this whole notion of NFPA4, which is interoperability testing between the fire alarm system and a, a, a number of other systems that that, that that fire alarm system integrates with. So, so uh, Brian, why don't you share with everybody, you know, what should they be looking for as they're collecting their fire alarm estimates from providers? Yeah, so this is a big deal. And so, you know, programming these systems in a controlled environment before it's brought to the job site, it can be a huge advantage and, and really have a big impact on uh, delivering a smooth installation. And so, you know, Todd, what it really allows us to do is it puts the programmer in a position where with minimal distractions, they can sit down, they can program the system, do some preliminary testing before connecting it to all the field equipment. And so the recommendation here is, is if, if offsite programs, programming isn't listed in the scope of work that you get from your provider, then um, ask for it. If it is listed, then it's a really a good best practice to um, see if the provider will, will uh, let you see how they go about doing that, maybe even tour their facilities so that you can make sure the, the, the needs of the project sort of matches the process that they go through to help, to help set up that head end equipment. Awesome, great comments, Brian, thank you. And here's the last one, and this is a big one. So local code knowledge. So if you're a fire alarm provider, part of your responsibility is to understand what the code requirements are. And you know, if you drive through three towns to get to your job site or 10 towns or whatever, you could have 10 different code requirements. It varies by town, by county, and by state. And, and so, the best providers know what that final sign-off is, is going to involve and think about that and contemplate that when they're handing you their estimate. And the best providers have relationships with the fire departments and the authorities having jurisdiction. So what are the outcomes from the code knowledge? It can drive your bid strategy. And, you know, Brian and I, you know, we, we lead part of the fire alarm business here in North America for Johnson Controls. And we see this all the time. The engineer is in New York City, but the job is going into Boston. And the engineer in New York City did it by the codes in New York City. But those are not the same codes that are going to be enforced in Boston. And we'll look at that and we'll go, oh, okay, we know that we're going to need three of these and five of those. 
you as a contractor, you know, are going to benefit from that if more devices need to be added because it's not on that original design and it gets missed in the plans and the specs. So code knowledge is, is really, I'll call it a vocation in the fire alarm provider space. And if, if you're not comfortable or you're not questioning what the code knowledge is, it's something that you might want to think about bringing up um, in your conversation. So, so Brian, maybe you can you can wrap this last topic, and uh, and also kind of tie it all together as far as how do you how do you know what you're getting once you get you know three or four bids together? What do you do for leveling? So wrap yeah. it up with code, and we'll take it to that. Yeah, yeah. So like Todd, as you said, I in I live in Huntsville, Alabama, and so it's kind of funny. I can get in my car drive roughly uh, 30 miles and probably travel through three or four different uh, code jurisdictions. I'm sure some of you could, could do that in 15 minutes um, as, as differentiated as, as your geographies uh, might, be, might be. But, you know, look, here's the important thing. So a lot of times these code, code differences are looks uh, very subtle, but the cost of them can be really uh, costly if you're working with a partner who doesn't necessarily understand the, the code requirements in that, that given jurisdiction. So it is a great practice, practice to make sure that you're working with someone who knows the local code requirements uh, of where the project is at, and then also has experience working with that local fire marshal. It can make all the difference in the world sometimes um, on the project. And so, Todd, what, what I would say to, to wrap this all up is, is, you know, if you're a contractor, how do you know that you're, you're buying the best scope of work that you could possibly buy for, for your project? And the number one thing that we recommend after the bid is have a really good, thorough, quality scope leveling meeting to make sure that you are able to take advantage of some of the things that we've talked about today and that and that your provider um, has everything covered and, and, the, and the prices um, have equitability in them in terms of what, what they're doing for you on your project. Yeah, no, it's, a, it's, 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 it's well put. When you look at the five topics that we talked about, um, you know, there's an opportunity for each one of these to speed up your installation and drive down the cost of your installation, be it in the labor bucket or the material bucket. So. You know, you might get five bids for a fire alarm project, and the bids are going to have assumptions from your from five different fire alarm providers that you need to make sense out of that'll make you most competitive to win. And these things that we have on the page, if you're looking for them from your fire alarm provider, and you see that there's a gap, or that they don't have it included, or the code knowledge isn't solid. Uh, and the code knowledge question will really come up because anybody can say, do you know the codes? Yeah, we know the codes. So you got to look at the legacy and the body of work that that fire alarm provider has, has delivered or understand their knowledge from the standpoint of other jobs that they've done and things they know the AHJ is enforced. If you're looking for those technology advantages, is the shop uh, drawing package tight and, and thorough? Look for samples of that. And these are all designed to help you win and maintain or beat the schedule that you got to deliver. And if I go back to the survey, 80% of you voted for somebody got ahead of the fire alarm installation. So if you can go faster, you can get in before other trades that could create a conflict. So we got two slides left for you and then we'll, we'll open it up to Q and A. And these really, these next two slides talk to two of the five elements that we shared with you today. And I'm going to turn it over to Brian to take you through the first one. Yeah, so thanks, Todd. So look, there's a lot of great fire alarm technology to choose from uh, in the market. And sometimes that technology is really good for helping keep construction costs down, but ends up being less than ideal solution for helping building owners keep their um, life cycle costs in check or at least predictable. And so then sometimes the reverse is true, right? So what's good for the customer and the, and the owner's long-term operating interest isn't necessarily uh, always in line or agreeable with keeping construction costs in budget. And so this technology that you're looking at on this page right now, it happens to satisfy both of those requirements and it's called addressable notification. What you're gonna get from this product during construction really boils down to a pretty simple concept um, in the fire alarm industry. And what it does is allows you to supervise your life safety wiring without maintaining what we call loop integrity 
uh, from the fire alarm panels, power source to all the inline resistors in the field. And so this is a big deal because it allows for less skilled labor to uh, install the wiring. It's not as complicated and that helps keep costs down. Uh, less wiring is required because of the addressable uh, device technology that helps speed up the installation. And then troubleshooting is much easier because we're able to pinpoint problems down to the specific device location and what that does is it ultimately um, eliminates a lot of the guesswork that goes into troubleshooting more traditional notification um, equipment. And so let's talk about the opposite side of that. So how does this help uh, the owner and what, what does the owner benefit from? So the first thing is uh, really, you know, testing of the system is much less disruptive to the occupants uh, of the building because we can complete that process without turning on all of the speakers and the horns and the strobes at one time. The other thing that's nice about this uh, product for the owner is that since there's less wiring in the systems, that in the system, there's a lot fewer possible uh, failure points, which helps keep down any kind of L and M labor, labor and material cost, which is a big deal to owners after they've occupied the building. And then the third thing is, look, you know, troubles do happen sometimes, but when they do with this product and this technology, they're a lot easier to solve because, as I mentioned earlier, you can pinpoint the problem not only down to the device level, but even to sections of wiring in the building so that you solve those problems a lot faster. And today, something that's really important to building owners is that uh, we spend a lot less time in their building. And then um, one thing that's also very important to bring up here, we're really to the point with this technology that its cost is very similar to um, the older technology most people are, are used to. and so. That's just a huge win-win, both for contractors uh, and owners. And so, Todd, I think um, you've got a, a slide, the next slide here. You're going to talk about a diagnostic tool that we have that really uh, can help the project run more smoothly. Yeah, thanks, Brian. So this this ties into that, that QC component that we talked about of what you should be looking for. So uh, a lot of times you don't know what the condition of the field wiring is until the fire alarm panel shows up. So as we talked about earlier, best demonstrated practices are test your branch circuits before the system gets there. So, so then, you know, we have a, we have a tool and I'm sure there's other manufacturers out there that, that have it, but ask for it. And our tool does a couple things. First thing it does is it stores all the testing, which is really cool because then you can print off, you could plug it into your laptop and you could print off the results of a test once you've corrected any of the field faults. And then you can show those test results, literally treat it like a submittal and send it into your GC and say, the wiring plant on floor three, branch two is complete. Here's evidence that it's, it's properly installed and clean. So that when you come back and you put the panel in play and that branch circuit is not lit up right, you can get paid. We can all get paid to go fix it. So, so I'll, I'll just I'll just hit on a couple of different things here. Um, duplicate addresses. So, you know, two devices that are the same device type both have the same address. That doesn't work in a fire alarm system when it has to light certain locations during a life safety event. So the uh, the idea here is to identify duplicate addresses so in the technology that brian and i sell and, and help install is we can actually light the devices in the circuit that have duplicate addresses so you can th imagine yourself or, or one of your um, team members walking down a hallway and they look up and there's two devices in that hallway that are lit when you're using this meter in 15 seconds you can get up your ladder and you can pull the device down and change the address and clear the fault okay same thing on the addressable notification which is what brian talked you through again we can detect where we have duplicate addresses and change those addresses based on the test results of your field wiring and then your fundamental um you know testing where you've got you're looking for shorts you're looking for grounds uh, our meter will also tell you if you're going to have a crosstalk condition in the wiring plant that's been installed so you know, again, think of, think of the device that, that we provide. It's like a mini fire alarm panel. It can test all the devices uh, long before your, your, your fire alarm panel shows up. And like I mentioned earlier, you don't want to use that expensive fire alarm panel as a, as a piece of test equipment. Because if you damage something or you blow up something, think about the supply chain issue that we're all dealing with. Now you need a card because the, you didn't test your, your, your field wiring properly or at all, and now you're stuck with a condition 
that uh, that you have that's going to stretch you out of the job and make you on it longer. So with that, um, Brian, I've I've pulled up the, the Q and A window, and I'm going to grab a couple of these, and I'm I'm just going to read them, and I'm going to I'm going to answer them live, and then I also ask you for some of your feedback. So this was a good one. So so Mark Smith, Mark, you've been really busy, man. You got like four or five questions in here, and thank you, they're all good ones. So I'm gonna I'm gonna grab I'm gonna grab one of them here. Will you explain why device mounting and terminations is on both electrician and fire alarm? It's a great question. It really depends on where you are. So if you're in the middle of New York City or Chicago, you know, where uh, you're, you're working with union contractors, many times they are doing the terminations based on the project labor agreement. When you get out to more rural areas, what, what I've experienced, and Brian, I'm sure you've experienced, is rather than train and make sure that the uh, skilled labor coming from the contractor is capable of doing the terminations, they'll ask the fire alarm provider to include it in their scope. So, um, Brian, anything to add to that topic of terminations? Well, no, not really. I mean, I think that's something that, that, that typically um, that typically gets covered in the scope of work and the um, relationship between the contractor and the system provider um, has to be worked through. And so that's where that agreement usually starts. And so, Todd, to your point, um, when the uh, electrical contractor decides that they want to install all the wiring and terminate all the devices, and that's how they'd like to approach the project, then we try to accommodate that and work with them to help give them a solution that fits that uh, delivery model. Um, and then sometimes some contractors like for us to install all the wiring in the field devices. And then in that case, we own um, the termination of the devices and the, and the quality of the work that's, that's done around that um, aspect of the project. And so it's really about how, we, how you establish your delivery plan at the beginning of the job. Here's what I would add to this though, is that you know, the, the challenges that you might see are more on the back end of you know, who owns the warranty. Uh, when something like that happens. And typically the way we approach it with our contractors, and I think a lot of our competitors are similar, is you sort of own that together, whether regardless of who, who terminated the device, so that we can solve that problem for the, for the, for the building owner and, and minimize their disruptions as much as possible. So hopefully that answers the question. No, that, that's great, that's great. I have another good one here. So. You said the contractor will benefit from a lack of code knowledge by an engineer because it will equate to additional devices. Is this so that the contractors can price these to an owner as an ad? So what we've experienced is while you're on the job, this is when you want to identify, um, you want to identify missing devices from the design. And together with your fire alarm provider, you go back to the GC and you say, hey, listen, fire alarm provider knows the AHJ is gonna be looking for three more devices in these locations, or we're not gonna get a certificate of occupancy. And a certificate of occupancy allows you to turn the system over, and that's almost like one of your, one of your final things that you need to do in order to get off the job. So, you know, really, it, it would most oftentimes be priced to a contractor, a general contractor, but if we're all working for an owner, that is definitely something that would be priced to an owner. It really depends on who you're working for. So, um, Brian, any, anything to add to that? No, I think you covered it, yeah. I mean, look, I mean, when we know that there's devices that are missing and it, the system isn't code compliant, we always, recommend that that get brought up during the bid process so it's clearly identified and we can address it then. But there are times when it does come up on the project and you have to deal with it. Um, and, and in those cases, um, what we would seek to do is get paid for anything that were left that was left out of the project that we wouldn't have known about or the electrical contractor might not have, might not have known about. So Brian, I'm gonna throw you a softball. So so how do you level the estimates you get? Let's say you get five estimates. How do you level them? Yeah, so I, I think the first thing you do is you, is you set up a meeting with uh, all of the people, the, the five uh, bidders, and you go through that estimate and um, review it with them. We always recommend 
that you use the same criteria when you're reviewing those the aspects of that bid with each with each provider. Uh, but what that'll allow you to do is to ask questions and understand how each uh, company is approaching um, those items or those issues to make sure your project is covered and that you've got a, a, a scope of work and a or a price that matches the scope of work that you need to deliver a successful project. Yeah, great. And 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 so so but and, and know that you know we as a company we level, right? So let's say that that we've got an opportunity to go after a fire alarm job where we're carrying the installation. So now we're accepting bids from folks who do what you do for a living. So we'll level in the same fashion. So we'll have a list of prescribed questions that are job specific to make sure, A, we understand the scope of work that's being carried, B, where does the demarcation of what we are signing up to do or what the contractor is signing up to do or what neither one of us are signing up to do that needs to be provided by others. And then understanding, you know, who's carrying it and who's not. Because what you'll expose is, you know, you know, a lot of you on this phone call have been doing this for a long time. You get five bids. You get somebody who's on the floor, you get somebody who's on the ceiling, and you get three that are close. And a lot of you throw out the highest and the lowest and you talk to the three that are close. And you bring the three in separately, uh, unless you're really courageous and you want to bring them in together. But you interview folks separately and you go, do you have this covered? Oh, I don't have that covered. Get it covered. Do you have this covered? Yes, I have it covered. Well, you shouldn't because we have it covered. So that'll move the cost floor of your provider around. And the leveling, the word leveling is intended to bring everybody in line so their scope is the same, what they're providing is the same, and more importantly, what they're not providing is the same. Okay, so leveling is an important step. Are you going to do leveling on a $10,000 fire alarm job? Probably not. But when it starts to get 50, 100, 150, a million dollars, when it starts to get big, you could be either you could either put yourself in a place to lose or you could leave a lot of money on the table if you don't go through that exercise. So I got another good one here, Brian, and this goes back to the shop drawing question. So how do you determine if the network requires shielding or non-shielded wire between the fire alarm control panel, the enunciator, and other control panels? And this, this person goes on to say, we recently completed a project without an engineered solution. We ran shielded wire and ran into some issues. So Brian, why don't you go back to the shop drawing, what to look for comments? I think I think the answer lies in there. Yeah, that's key, Todd. So typically what you want to look for is details on your shop drawings to explain how to deal with a shield, a shielded cable uh, when it's a part of your project. So you know, typically that's uh, something that gets called out in the specification. If it's not called out in the specification, then you have to think about um, you know how the wiring is being run. Is it being run through a cable tray? Is it being run in uh, conduit? Is it a, in an open air plenum type configuration? But when when you do have one of those situations sort of exist on your on your project, then your design engineer from the provider that you've chosen will be able to detail out how you how you should handle the shield in those situations, so that you don't have those problems. Exactly, exactly. And get an understanding up front before you get into that mess of do I terminate this shield? Do I not terminate this shield? Is a shielded wire required? The drawing package and cut sheets should ex explain it clearly. And if you have a question, you can reach out to the person who put it together because they should know the answer. And if they don't, you should question why they don't know the answer. So, so here's another one. So, so Brian, I'm going to throw this out to you. Cold, cold question. I'm, I'm, I'm going to put you on the spot. What do you do if the engineer says you are not allowed to T-tap the notification circuits, even though your addressable notification circuits technology allows this to be done? What would you do yeah. if that came up, Brian? So I think that's a great, it's a great question, and it's something that does come up pretty often. So I think the first answer to that is, is that. If the engineer um, doesn't want T-tapped or won't allow T-tap circuits on a project, then then this technology might not be the best solution um, uh, for that application. And so the first thing we would do is is try to have a conversation with the electrical engineer and make sure that they understand how the technology works and, and then get them comfortable with it. If they're still not comfortable with it, 
Um, then like I said earlier, there's other benefits to um, the addressable technology that, that we talked about earlier. I won't go into all of them right now. I've talked about a few of them, but um, you know, if you can't, if you have to loop the wiring, then like I said, this is the addressable um, true alert notification is, is maybe not a great solution for that application. Yeah, so, so, so that would be, so in that scenario, you want to look at the application for sure. So here's, here's the, the flip side of that. If it's a good application for it, and I'm you as a contractor, I'm petitioning my fire alarm provider, in this case it might be Johnson Controls, to say, hey, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm hearing from the engineer, they're not going to let me T-tap. If we can get the engineer to allow this, I'm going to save a lot of the installation, and I'm going to be able to use you. You put it right back on the person who gave you a quote, and boy, if that person is working for us and they're not in their car in the way of the engineer to convince them, then maybe we got the wrong person in front of you. But I would be coaching that salesperson if they worked for us to get with that engineer and a understand. Why is there apprehension with TTAP? It very well could be they don't understand the technology, and if they understood the technology, they would feel comfortable with it. And then, you know, a good fire alarm provider, when they're not giving you estimates and working with you on jobs, they're canvassing the engineering community, and they're teaching the engineering community what the technology does and why it's beneficial. So in many cases, you can't get to every engineer, right? So you got to, and, and the other thing to think about is you got engineers in different cities writing writing specs for jobs that are going to install way outside of their jurisdiction. So it's important to make sure that if you run into resistance from the from the engineer who's got to approve the submittals, and Brian and I have been through it a million times. You do your fire alarm submittal, and you got 50 comments or questions that come back, and you got to answer all of them. A lot of those are based on the level of understanding of the technology the engineer has. And the more comfortable they get with it, the less resistance we're going to get. And we've seen that. And we've seen that. So, so I'm going to look for uh, just a couple more questions here, um, Brian. And yeah. uh, so this one, I'm not sure I can answer this, but a lot of the peers on the call could. And maybe you want to you want to chat it in um, in the form of a question. So here is the question. Where do electrical contractors most commonly fall short in terms of their fire alarm system takeoff? So Brian, I'll throw that one over to you and then I'll share my thoughts around this one. And if, if you want to answer this, by the way, answer it in the form of a question and I'll read it off. Yeah, I think everybody, depending on who you talk to, might have a little bit of a different answer, right, Todd? So, um, you know, look, I, I think it depends on the scope of work the contractor is pricing. So I would say if the contractor is responsible for installing all the field peripheral devices, um, common problems that you typically run into is just an understanding of how the, the circuits need to be run in the building. That's something that comes up uh, often. Obviously code deficiencies, if they don't have a good fire alarm uh, partner to work with and maybe there are items that are missed and you know typically subtle items can be covered without a big gap in um, creating a, a cost disadvantage for, for the provider and then two even when those come up um, most contractors are, are willing and, and share that same information with uh, other providers that they may be working with on the project so that we do keep that uh, scope level um, but but I would say wiring code deficiencies um, are, are the two biggest uh, issues. So sometimes, too, you know, you run into issues where uh, contractors maybe overlook the fact that a job's going to be phased in over a period of time, and maybe don't allot the right the right uh, for the right amount of time to go through multiple inspections with fire marshals. Um, that can be an issue too, but I still say, you know, getting the wiring right is probably at the top of the list. Yeah, and, and everything you mentioned, Brian, I won't say everything, most of what you mentioned can be answered by the fire alarm provider. So, you know, there are some contractors on this phone uh, who are very large and they have, large, they have an estimating department, they have a purchasing department, and, you know, they work out of a three or four story building and they do a lot of volume. And they have resources that can flush this stuff out. And then we have a lot of other contractors that are on this phone that might have four trucks, it's a family-owned business, and 
you know, you're doing the estimate at night and you're doing the installation during the day. And then you got everybody of different sizes in between. The common, the common thread to all of you is a good partner that can help you navigate, hey, what, what am I, here's my takeoff for this job. Is this what you see? And you reach out to your fire alarm provider or providers because you're gonna get a, you're gonna get a quorum. Some people may find things that you missed. Some people may miss things that you found. So the more that you keep it interactive, instead of just dropping a scan into an email out to five providers and say, bid this, have a live conversation. There's a lot that could be learned when you're having a discussion around the job. And then you can start to ask, well, how do I optimize the installation of the system? Do I run a main branch circuit up the middle of the building? Or do I run two up either side to pick up different sets of floors? There's a lot of different ways to do this. But at the end of the day, if you go back to that equation, you're thinking about how to get faster and use less material while you're putting the estimate together and while you're choosing your fire alarm provider. You're going to put yourself in the best chance to, number one, win, and then, number two, install your job without erosion, without cost erosion. So with that, I've gone through most of the questions that I, I think we have the skill set to answer. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and, uh, and start the wrap up. And first by saying thank you for joining us today. And um, we appreciate your time. We hope you found this valuable. And uh, don't underestimate how much your fire alarm provider can help you as you're putting the estimate together. But probably most importantly, look for those five things that Brian and I took you through. Um, because it will differentiate what you get sent in for estimates and how you should think about it and contemplate it in your overall cost. So, Brian, I'll leave it to you to sign us off. Yeah, no, I appreciate everybody's, uh, uh, you know, attention today and joining us. Hopefully you got something out of this. There were a lot of questions that we didn't get an an or weren't able to answer. So what I would encourage you to do is um, you can reach out to myself or Todd and, and we'll try to answer the, your questions. Some of these questions we'll take and answer and get back to you. But you could also reach out to our local uh, branch office and talk to a salesperson uh, and they could help you as well. So uh, with that, I would just say thank you for joining and um, hope everybody has a great day. All right, yeah, thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Brian and Todd, so much for that great presentation and that fantastic back and forth discussion at the end. Um, I know we had a lot of questions come in, um, so we know that it was a very engaging presentation. So on behalf of Electrical Contractor Magazine and Johnson Controls, I just want to thank everyone for attending and thank you again, Brian and Todd. So please don't feel, forget to fill out the survey. Um, it should pop up on your screen at the end of the webinar. Um, and if you want to be contacted by Johnson Controls, one of the questions in that survey is asking if, you, if you'd like to be contacted. So that's a good, uh, a good thing to do. Um, and also don't forget, we're going to be, we're recording this webinar, so you'll receive a link to the recording at, uh, sometime today after the webinar is over. Um, and it should be available pretty soon to watch. So I hope everyone has a great rest of the day.